Welcome, everybody. We are talking to Joel Salatin, who is the face of Polyface Farms and also known as the Lunatic Farmer. And when his name slips my mind, I call him the Piggerator Guy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so quite a few years ago, we saw a documentary on Polyface Farms. Uh, recommended by I think my cousin was a biodynamic farmer and when we told him that we were going to talk to Joel Salatin, and he was very very envious <laughs> <laughs> and you've been fanboying a lot oh yeah I've been fanboying yeah so we're we're so excited and so grateful that you said yes to do this interview it, it means a lot to us and it means a lot yeah it means a lot for us to um, to spread your word because I don't think that maybe not so many people in Europe or in Scandinavia know who you are. And we Outs think outside of like people who are already doing like uh, farming in, yeah. an, in a different sure. way yeah. uh, than the traditional, yeah. so-called sure. traditional ones, the modern one, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually uh, spent, I actually uh, did numerous seminars in Europe, you know, pre pre-COVID. Oh, okay. um, I, I was there. I've been to the Netherlands. I don't know what uh, seven times, maybe uh, Sweden, Norway, um, Germany, multiple times, Austria, Spain, multiple times, Great. Uh, France and Italy. And um, so, you know, I've 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 been uh, been through there, uh, you know, primarily, you know, uh, agriculture, you know, agriculture related things. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and so you know, so your audience, no doubt, I'm, I'm a I'm a bridge builder, and uh, so I I appreciate you um, uh, spanning that you know to bring this bring this bridge to maybe people who uh, haven't thought about some of these things. So yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. I'm very grateful. Well, good. Well, first of all, thank thank you for just being and and doing what you're doing because it's it's so important that there are still people out there like you who are living uh, in accordance with the principles of, of nature and on a scale where it's uh, feasible and we can bring these principles back and, and, and get food that is nutritious, not just for our bodies, but our souls as well. Um, and, and I would like to start out by, by asking like where, where did you start from? Like, when did you see it go wrong? And, and how did you come up with this way of, of rectifying uh, what is going on with our like monocultural cultural? <laughs> sure. Well, um, I, I have this, uh, I apparently have some, uh, you know, some genetic material in my DNA that is uh, um, whatever, uh, counter, counter, uh, counter orthodoxy. Uh, my grandfather, my dad's dad, was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine in whatever, 1948, you know, when it first came out. A lot of people don't realize that just uh, post-World War II, uh, there, was, there was quite a, you know, much of the world was still using draft power, um, much of the world was still not electrified. And, and, and so, uh, so there, was, there was a real, certainly here in America, uh, there was a real um, tension between which way our country would go post World War II. Would we go, you know, the the chemical industrial approach, or would we go? Um, uh, uh, would we see food and farming as primarily a a biological thing, or would we see it as a mechanical thing? And um, and, and that that was not clear. Uh, but but post World War II, with all the you know stockpiles of ammonium nitrate and potassium and phosphorus and ammunition stockpiles that were left over and the and all the infrastructure distribution and development that had been that had put in in ammunition um, which is the same ingredients for chemical fertilizer uh, there, there was a, there was a uh, there was a, an, a very biased uh, you know uh, affinity economically emotionally and, and and to be to be fair to our uh, grandfather, grandparents, and great grandparents, um, they lost many sons in the war, and who didn't come back to the farm, and everything was on a shovel. You know, they didn't have front end loaders. They didn't have you know the kind of 
tool uh, equipment that we have today. And frankly, they were they were tired of shoveling. And uh, and 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 in those days, if you wanted to do it without chemicals, it was a lot of shoveling. Yeah. And, 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 and they had shoveled and shoveled and shoveled and shoveled until they were done shoveling. And so I, I always encourage people to be to be gentle and not be try not to be too judgmental on your ancestors who who had lost children in the war, who who now were presented. Do you want to shovel or do you want to use this bag of material? Yeah. That's, really, that's real easy to apply. And, and so like all um, uh, b- because realize that modern modern scientific composting had really not been brought to the world until 1943 when Sir Albert Howard wrote an agricultural testament. That was kind of the that that was the that was the cookbook. That that was the recipe. He's considered now, you know, kind of the the godfather of um, of of modern, you know, whatever regenerative sustainable agriculture, and and that was not till 1943. Uh, based on the work that he, you know, discovered in India uh, during his time there, and so, so you know, uh, 1943, the world was kind of um, uh, caught up in another uh, issue, and and so, so like all innovation, getting that recipe together of modern aerobic scientific composting as a as a fertile as a fertility uh, program um, didn't have that innovation did not have the infrastructure around it to fully metabolize it, which is, which is common with, you know, with any kind of innovation. It, you, have, you have this point of a spear in innovation, and then you have this ragged edge of, of, uh, of protocols, infrastructure, and different things to metabolize the, you know, the, 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 uh, the point of the innovation. And so it took about 20 years from 1943 to about 19, arguably 63, we'll just say about 20 years, uh, for you know um, front end loaders, uh, black black pipe, black plastic pipe for easy water delivery, easy pumping, um, uh, chippers, wood chippers, chainsaws. You know the modern chainsaw did not really get finished development until the late 1950s, uh, which which allowed us to to really move to a carbon based an efficient carbon-based uh, fertility program uh, at scale, you know, at, at commercial scale. And, and so these pieces of the infrastructure gradually came about during the late 40s and 50s until finally when we got to 60, you know, we had that, but that gave that gave the chemical side a running head start, you know, in this, in this race. And, uh, and, and by the 1960s had thoroughly convinced the you know the government agencies, the land grant universities, uh, and and you know it, we were those of us that were in the um, the the more you know uh, that 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 biology or the, that life is fundamentally biological and not mechanical. Yeah. We were we we were kind of late to the party. You know, I mean we 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 didn't have our duds yet. We didn't have our our stuff together uh, to come to that party. So my dad got his you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, bent in the ecology from his dad and I got it from dad. So, you know, I, uh, we're, we're multi-generation into this, into this, um, uh, you know, uh, carbon, carbon-based, you know, carbon-based uh, fertility program. It, it seems like you were saying in the beginning, basically that the war machine was turned on the people and and farming after being turned away from where it had been used before. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, the the all of the inertia, the inertia of um, of technical expertise, distribution, brand branding, brand names, advertising, mm. uh, uh, warehousing, inventorying, all of that was was developed. Uh, through the war machine and so when all of that after the war turned into uh, bagged and 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 bulk you know chemical ammonium nitrate for fields Mm. fields instead of um, you know for growing fields instead of battlefields um, that that created a very um, inordinate cost cost comparison 
Mm. Uh, but, you know, between the two, interestingly, you know, now here we are, you know, uh, a few decades later and, and that price differential is pretty much, um, is pretty much leaving. And the, the biological approach, the carbon, the carbon-based uh, biomass approach is actually, uh, you know, gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, you know, interesting here on our farm, you know, we've always uh, been accused of being elitist you know our price tag is higher than what's at the supermarket and things like that and mm -hmm. suddenly we're finding ourselves either lower priced or certainly priced competitive with the supermarkets because we're seeing in the last 12 months with energy prices escalating and of course all chemical all chemical fertilizer herbicides pesticides are all petroleum they're all petroleum based uh, you know, different, different configurations yeah. of, of petroleum. And so as that has, has escalated, fortunately, the, the sun, the sun does not charge us anymore for its rays that bathe our farm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, so while the, while the gas pr prices are increasing, we've seen in the last 12 months, for example, uh, ammonium nitrate, which is you know, nitrogen fertilizer has gone up like 175%, imagine that, 175% in 12 months, uh, potassium, uh, super, super, super phosphate, those fertilizers have gone up almost 100% and, and, and still are, are escalating. And, and meanwhile, we're sitting here, we don't buy any of that. We don't buy any of it. And so we're, we're very much, um, you know, not completely because we do use some fuel, but we are, in, in, the, in the big scheme of things, we are far more um, independent, disentangled um, from, from those uh, escalating uh, uh, inputs now than mm. the average farmer. And so uh, we're, 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 all, we're in this kind of uh, interesting spot where we're looking around saying, are we suddenly going to become the, the price competitive? It has all this stuff that we've had all our lives um, is, it is, is authentic food actually going to become cheaper than, than, uh, than unauthentic food, you know, uh, that's, that's quite a, that's quite a fascinating, um, it, it's just an inversion of a lot of yeah. things. It, yeah. It's a very, it's a very disturbing time. Uh, not, 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 not the least of which is the fact that being a small operation versus a very large operation, um, we are like a speedboat where we can navigate the rocks and the shoals in this disturbing COVID uh, era, whereas the great big companies, you know, they wake up every day wondering who's going to turn them in for improper, you know, uh, COVID quarantine protocols or who's going to, you know, be sick and they have to send the whole, you know, that whole division off for, you know, five days of, of uh, recuperation. All those kinds of human resource, the, 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 those litigation, those kind of things. You know, mm. with with our little, you know, 25 person loyal, uh, loyal team, we don't wake up in the morning with those kinds of uh, um, inefficiencies gumming up our works. We just go about our business, you know, and yeah. and, and get after it. And um, and so there's just there's just a lot of facets in this current uh, scene that are changing some of the, um, you know, some of the assumptions, the axioms that we've had for 50 years. It's 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 the most exciting it's the most exciting to, to time to be in this space that i've ever i've ever seen but there's yeah. also like a, a huge like one of the the reasons we're doing this thing is like we see a, a huge movement of people like they they see where there's two tracks and one is leading to quite a dystopic uh, vision and the other one is uh, uh very much a returning to to the land and in some ways and there's so many people looking into to homesteading and and all this stuff and and you have a very very beautiful model of 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 how to do that and 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 return that soil that has been killed by that farming practice that we're talking about yeah bringing bringing the soil bringing the earth back to life and uh, as far as i remember in the documentary i saw you said that uh, if we're talking about carbon if everybody did farming your way uh was in, in three years we could tie in all the the excess carbon that's ever been produced or is that an exaggeration in my mind <laughs> well um well no it, it's actually it's you know it might it might be 
it might not be able to be done that fast. Uh, and I don't remember whether I said three years, it might, you know, I might've said something like 10 years or something like that, but, but, but the, but the point is, the point is that, um, that with a, with an overhaul, um, of our production practices, mm -hmm. we could, we could very, very quickly, um, bring the carbon, you know, from the atmosphere into the soil, uh, mm -hmm. that that's a fact. And whether it's, you know, whether it's, three years, five years, or 10 years, the point is, it's not 500 years, yeah. it's not even 100 years, and it, and, um, and it doesn't require us all to starve. Uh, it, there's, there's plenty to feed everybody. Um, you know, the, the fact is that if we had had a Manhattan Project, and, you know, if everybody knows the Manhattan Project was the development yeah. of the atomic bomb, if we had had a, a Manhattan Project for compost, not only would we have not only would we have fed the world beautifully, but we would have done it without a dead zone the size of Rhode Island and the Gulf of Mexico. We would have done it without four legged, you know, you know, without three legged salamanders and infertile frogs. Yeah. And so the, the kinds of things that Rachel Carson wrote about in Silent Spring, you know, in, in the beginning of 1960s, you know, those kind of things were completely unnecessary, you know had we focused our attention on a, you know, on, on, a, on a biological approach to life as opposed to a mechanical approach mm -hmm. uh, to life. And so, yeah, yeah, that, that kind of reversion is, is uh, possible and great. Uh, and and you're, you're mentioning that there are people, you know, going back to the land. Yes, uh, I call it a homesteading uh, tsunami. There is yeah. a homesteading tsunami going on right now uh it, it's fascinating it, apparently you're seeing it even in europe uh mm -hmm. in america in, in the u.s here there is just um there is just a burgeoning movement and, and in fact it has moved the price of small acreages uh you know five to twelve acres have have literally doubled in price in the last 12 months wow. as this pressure that is incredible. Yeah, as this pressure, it, it hasn't affected large acreage as much. You know, so I'd say something over over fifty acres has, has not been affected very much, but but the but the small acreages have been greatly affected by this. You know, uh, uh, by this movement into homesteading. So you know, in some ways here at our farm, you know, the the message that we've been the message that we've been preaching all our lives about. Um, healing your own soil, uh, a diverse, a diversified uh, production portfolio where you have plants and animals, uh, you know, multi-speciation, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it, it, we, we just feel like we're, like we're on a surfboard. We've caught a big wave, you know, and we're on a surfboard coming in. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, I wrote, uh, I, I wrote Pastured Poultry Profits uh, it came out in 1993. That's almost 30 years ago. That 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 that, uh, that. first yeah, isn't that something <laughs> that first book came out? And, and and when I wrote that book, all of the you know the gurus that are that were in that business, they said, well, books like this have about a 10 year run. You know, they yeah. they sell, then they peak, uh, and and then they drop off, and about a 10 year run. Well, we're 30 years into it, and we're selling more now than we did 30 years ago and That's and what, great. and what that indicates to me is that this 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 whatever um this rising tide is is very much rising look when when, when people when people get concerned when people get scared they head for the hills yeah there, there there's a sense among most people intuitively that if if things are going to uh, break up or collapse or go, you know, whatever, uh, as we say, the wheels are going to fall off. It, if, if there's going to be disturbance, I don't want to be stuck in a city. No, nope. I, 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 I want to be somewhere else. And so that is part of what's driving this. But my, my message now to all these people is make sure that you're not running away in fear, but make sure that you're running to faith. Yeah. Because if you're simply running away in fear, you, you, you won't make it. You will be disappointed. It'll be harder than you think. You won't have staying power. 
and, and, and you'll just be uh, frustrated and angry. But if you are, if you are, you know, it's okay to be fearful initially, but if you aren't then embracing, we're, we're not, we're not going to sit around and be angry and frustrated. We're actually going to embrace a creative solution by faith. Then you'll make it, you'll have staying power to make it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and wow. do you see this, this, I mean, do you see this leading to like where we all want to go? Do you, you think, you think we'll make it? <laughs> well, I, I, I have no idea. Uh, you know, I'm not a prophet. I don't make prophecies, I, but I, I do, I do think that we're in a, um, you know, we're, we're in a, we're in a real state globally of, of disturbance. And so, um what what i do think is that the capacity for individuals i'm i'm not real optimistic about where you know whatever western culture is headed I, i'm not optimistic mm -hmm. about uh, about the overall you know uh, situation but i'm very optimistic about what individuals in proximate communities creating what i call a parallel universe how, how they can flourish in this situation so so if if you can if you can become close um both preferably geographically if you can develop uh geographic proximate communities that have a broad enough eclectic skill base uh, and interest base of people who know how to grow things build things and fix things so grow things, build things, and fix things. If you have those people close to you in your life, you you can you can get along almost with, without a lot of the trappings of Western civilization. You know, I've been um, I ha I have a deep uh, abiding interest in uh, in the Native American culture, and when I'm in Australia, I get you know at books about the Aborigines and things, and it. It's really been a, a point of, of uh, interest here in my ponderings lately. The, the striking significance that these cultures, these cultures lived for centuries without, without money, without banks, you know, without, without uh, corporations, uh, stock exchanges, um, automobiles, um you know electricity i mean how did they do that how how, yeah, how did they how did how did they, how did they make <laughs> and, and you know it it just it just strikes me that the the sophistic the level of sophistication and complication that we have surrounded ourselves with uh now i mean you know, the, the average American male now between 25 and 35 years old, the average American male spends uh, uh, between 25 and 35 spends 20 hours a week playing video games. I mean, w w when you start thinking about productive capacity, yeah. you know, th th this is, this is male, male time between 25 and 35, arguably the most, you know, productive you know, high energy time of a male, right? Um, and, and and 20 hours a week on average being spent um, playing video games. And you think, well, if, if that, if that were channeled somewhere else in, in, in gardening, in, in, uh, you know, in, in digging a cistern at your house to collect roof rainwater. So, so you could eliminate um, you know, uh, uh, flooding uh, and, and, and have water to water your, you know, your plants. Um, goodness, you know, creating a, an earthworm bed, having, you know, backyard chickens, uh, taking a butchery, a butchery class, to learn how to, you know, break down a sheep or a goat or a, a, a cow, a cheese making class, how to, you know, um, there are, there are all sorts of, of, there is a lot of wealth out there that is non-monetary wealth. Um, um, Chris Martinson wrote a book back in whatever, you know, 2007. Uh, the title is Peak Prosperity. And it was, it, what he identified there was 
what is non-monetary wealth? Talking about health, relationships, skill, knowledge, and, and all of those can be acquired outside of the, you know, the, the, the regular Wall Street universe. Yeah. And, and so I think as we start looking at the future, we need to start thinking about how to, what are some of the principles, what are some of the things that people had a thousand years ago um, that enabled them to thrive in a, you know, in a less technologically advanced uh, state. But and, those things uh, have to be attractive, attractive enough. And, and like, as you see, there's this, this, this say there's this tsunami of, of homesteading. So right now, people are starting to discover that sitting around and playing video games all the time is not feeding their soul. And that so at least some people are discovering yes. that we need to feed not just our bellies, but our, our souls with meaningful work like you're talking about. So we have to, and we have to make it at, attractive to people and we have to also make it, make it legal. Like you're saying, harvesting rainwater and, and, and such and having chickens maybe in, in suburban places. Like there are many places where this is not allowed. Um, yeah, I know in the 70s and 80s in Denmark, my parents, they were like uh, charged charged for making their own food in their backyard so they had to pay for and for, they, for their own food right yeah, and they and, did it and, because they didn't have any money and recently yeah. they had their they had their well shut off because they yeah. were not on the I'm, water mains yeah i'm raised okay. on water um, on well water yeah so i have i have a question from uh, from my my cousin and he said, how do you keep the spirits up uh, and in, in this trying to make the world a better place when uh, most people are happily letting themselves be run by tyrants and uh, to avoid taking responsibility for their own lives? Yeah, um, it, it's a it's a great question. It's a it's a fair question. And so um, I, I kind of I kind of danced at it a little bit here in the in the previous little segment. Mm -hmm. and and so you, you can see what's going on you can look around and you can you can either be angry and frustrated which mm -hmm. are, are primarily negative <laughs> negative emotions or you can look at this and say well can i be part of the solution can i uh, you know and, and 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 cultivate a positive energy that says can i can i be can i be a help can i be a, a solution and so uh, so what we have done here, sure, you know, everybody needs to go and stomp and scream and complain, you know, once in a while, uh, that, that, that's okay. But, but, it, but, but what that needs to lead to is, um, is, is a positive, proactive uh, demeanor theme in which, we, so we see ourselves as when, as, as things develop toward hopeless toward hopeless and helpless um, thoughts we need to be a place that provides help and hope when others become helpless and hopeless yeah. and, and and that is a that is a noble and sacred goal objective and 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 for different people that will look different that, that'll be that'll be a different thing I mean it's not always going to be planting tomatoes in your garden. I mean, it, it, it can be numerous things. Um, uh, you know, for some people, it simply might be um, buying directly from a farm instead of a supermarket to supporting something. Uh hey, thanks for watching. If you liked what you just saw, head on over to whoselifeisitsummit.com forward slash podcast, where you can find full length episodes as well as in audio format. And we do a lot of other cool stuff. You can hang out with us and other like-minded individuals who want to create a world that works for everyone. And we do that on our platform where we can chat and we have Q and A's and exclusive interviews as well. So there's so much to get over there. So come on over and play with us.